This video is about Empire of Ash, the upcoming Doom of Valyria prequel TV series to Game of Thrones. It's the third of three faction profiles I'm making, and this one is on the faction known as the Freeholders. The Freeholders are rich merchant princes, bankers and magisters, the local elites, below the dragon lords, but above the slaves. They're not dragon lords, they don't have dragons, but that isn't their strategy. Their strength is money, they're the richest faction. So it's money as power. And they're not so much one unified faction as an alliance of various sub-factions that came together in common cause, merchants from all over the Valyrian Freehold. As a result of that, the subgroups are very diverse and interesting, and over half of them aren't white. Like I said, as in A Song of Ice and Fire, a lot of thought went into world-building the Valyrian Freehold, I mean, all of it, how its economy realistically functions, which regions produce which things that give them strategic value in war, or would make certain merchants powerful money barons. So I honestly thought, going into the video chat where this was leaked to me, I, I asked them, oh, so are they going to be based in Volantis or perhaps Marine? <laughs> that I thought, oh, they'll use this as an opportunity to work in a location the TV audience is already familiar with. And they looked at me and went, actually, they're based in Sothorios. They're all over the Freehold, but their stronghold is in Sothorios. The Freeholders aren't so much one uniform faction, but an alliance formed by several different sub-factions coming together in common cause. They're the newest organization, to the point they're not uniform yet, that you can have what is a typical Sphinx-like, what is a typical young dragon-like, that there's different subgroups of Freeholders, that one isn't representative of all of them that they're the rich and powerful local elites below dragon lords from across the entire freehold, which is vast, with many diverse groups and cultures. So in this part two video, that's what I'm going to be focusing on, the, the diversity and locations we'll see. Four major points I'm going to go through. First, basic economic and strategic geography of the Valyrian Freehold, you know, going over what sub-factions of Freeholders we might see from Pentos to Marine. Then, and this touches on leak info, why the Freeholders stronghold is in Sothorios, that start with the general of at least this is what parts of their world are like that we might see, I, just stuff we know from the world book, and then getting to act, that's me analyzing this, but then getting to specific leak stuff I was told of, well, why is Sothorios the province we're seeing the most? What's it like? Why is it the most powerful? And what might we see? And how this brings up issues of diversity, immigration, and cultural identity. And then something which I was told with some emphasis on screen locations and production budget plans of, okay, well, these are locations which exist in the Valyrian Freehold, but will they have the time and budget to literally show 300 dragons in a single scene, or to make a fully realized set of Mir and Volantis and Pentos and Valyria itself? That just, okay, not just as an abstraction. Their series Bible actually has plans laid out for these are locations we would have the budget to show and these are ways we're going to cut the budget of what are we going to focus on as a physical location. You know, think like Game of Thrones Season 1. We didn't see every location. We didn't need to. And in the fourth and final section, uh, this is more of my analysis, not new stuff. What we know of Sothorios already from the novels... It, which isn't a lot, just in context, well, it's history, that there are literally dinosaurs in it, that it is fantasy Africa and what that brings up with issues. And yes, my source and I did talk about Yin, and I will get to that.
Now, like I said in part one of this video, the Freeholders are comparable to the Separatist Alliance from Star Wars. I think they're a good analogy, just because both of them are copying the secessionist movements when the Roman Empire was falling apart. They're both inspired by Rome. So obviously there would be some parallels to that. That when you saw the Separatist Alliance in Star Wars, they were this new faction. They hadn't existed for generations they were this new alliance of sub-factions coming together of the power elites and bankers and merchant princes. So they didn't have a uniform culture, but you had this diverse alliance. You had the Nemoidians, you had the Techno Union, gives its full support to your treaty. The, the banking clan will sign your treaty. That When you see them in their council, that these are entirely different cultures that I imagine they would have different religions and practices, and also extends to the battlefield, that when you go through what the separatist military is like, it isn't as uniform as the Republic, that you have various subtypes of droids. You have the Commerce Guild makes the spider droids. The Banking Clan uses the Hailfire droid the tanks. That you see, they, they actually said when they were originally making the prequel trilogy, they thought they were going to make a uniform army, and then around episode two, they said, self-consciously, we should make it a diverse mixture of units to reflect the fact that it's actually these local security forces that were recently combined. And so I can see the Freeholders being like that, that there's not just going to be a standard Freeholder army. And really, an alliance of different sub-factions is very interesting for story and world-building. That uh, on a lot of levels, you get a variety of character and costume designs, for example, uh, both military and courtly. Like when we see them in their council, like the Separatist Alliance in Star Wars, you can make up all of these different costumes to reflect the different regions of Essos that they're from as sort of representing that. Or their military units can have widely different statistics and abilities depending on where they're from. I'd like to think of it in terms of spin-off games, too, you know, like PC, tabletop. You know, if, if we're doing a, a Total War mod of this, uh, they're not going to focus on every possible sub-faction on screen in the TV series. That they say, well, we're, we're focusing on the ones that are from Sothorios, and we'll see some of the other ones leaving you free to expand on your own, like uh, spin-off Star Wars prequel games. In On screen, we still mostly saw the units of the Trade Federation and the Techno Union, but we barely saw the Commerce Guild or the Banking Clan as much, whereas like in spin-off cartoons, they could really have a lot more developed Banking Clan characters beyond a single line or two show uh, political intrigue within the Commerce Guild, and different military units. So in terms of spin-off cartoons, games, this is, you could have a good-sized expanded universe like that when they show the world is bigger than what we can fit into the TV screen right now. And we'll get a sampling, that's what I'm looking for, we'll get a sampling of what are all the other freeholder groups like. So now I'm going to go region by region, and because it's rooted in, you know, realistically you know, in economics, what would make each region valuable? What would define it in terms of resources? I'm going to go through this. This is Essos from Pentos to Slaver's Bay. Starting with the Valyrian Peninsula itself, you have old Valyria. Valyria, Valyria, the capital city, was on the southern tip. And it wasn't the whole Valyrian Peninsula, though. It's loosely comparable to Italy, if you think, well, they're like the Romans, and it's this peninsula that they spread out through, if you think, early Roman history. Because north of Valyria, you have the Fourteen Flames, this chain of volcanoes, it was in the middle of the peninsula. And, you know, when they exploded in the doom, they sank into the sea. So where you see on the map here the Smoking Sea, that's where the volcanoes used to be. And I've seen some theories that maybe Tyria and Oros defended a strategic mountain pass because it seems like they're located right next to each other on north, northern and southern side of the volcanoes. We don't know. But that there's all the... On a map, it's mysterious that it wasn't just Valyria in that peninsula. There's 
uh, map icons showing their dead cities there that must have had some function or identity before the doom. So, southern tip, you have Old Valyria, the capital. Middle, you have the mountains, which they said were very rich in ores. They imported vast numbers of slaves to these rich mines, getting a lot of iron and other metals. And north of the volcano chain, but south of the Painted Mountains are sort of their version of the Alps, by this analogy, that, that separate the peninsula from the Dothraki Sea, these huge mountains called the Painted Mountains. But between the volcanoes, Painted Mountains, between Volantis and Slaver's Bay, you have the lands of the long summer. And the books have barely described this, much less what were they like before the doom. But there's this remark in the world book that they were once the most fertile region in the entire world. Like, this is a region that, that put the Reach in Westeros to shame. This used to be the most verdant agricultural region they had. So I think we can guess that maybe this is a major breadbasket region. It just It's not like, oh, we specialize in olives or spices or exotic things like staple crops. I think they'd be producing there. And east of that, you have Slaver's Bay, which the different cities do different things to an extent, but they are the major slave exporting region, capturing them in foreign raids, then breeding and trading them in peace. They inherited this from the Gascari because they already had the apparatus in place and the infrastructure for will we process slaves. And Valyria's mines in the 14 Flames have a great demand for slaves. So you can see how the economics moves, that they import slaves from Slaver's Bay to get work to death in the mines, but this is where they're generating them, and in return, Valyria produces metals in the, in the mountains. Now, they, this is explained a bit more in A Dance with Dragons, the fifth novel, that Slaver's Bay was once more diversified back in the days of the Gascari Empire, and there's this point where they go, well, we specialized in slaves so much because originally, in the time of the old empire, they had rich farmlands and timber, and copper mines. But after the Valyrians conquered the old Giscari Empire, uh, they burned out all of the forests so there's no more timber, and without timber and trees to hold in the soil, it washed away in the rains. Uh, like what happened to the Maya, where they cut down all the trees and then it washed out all the farmland. So, historically, they had rich farmland. Now, I mean, it's enough to make food. They, they mention olive plantations, but it's not enough to be a very fertile region anymore, and they don't have timber. And the one thing they do have left in terms of a surplus is copper, but they said, well, that was useful back in the Bronze Age when the Valyrians and Giscari were fighting each other, that bronze is made from an alloy of copper and tin, but copper isn't really that valuable of a metal anymore. I mean, it's not as cheap as iron, but it's not that useful. It, we specialize in slaves. It's this crippling over-specialization that if Daenerys wants to ban slavery, we don't have an economy outside of that. So that's an idea of what that region produces. Now, unlike Slaver's Bay, the free cities to the west of Valyria itself are very diverse and have their own unique subcultures from one to the next and each specifies in its own unique economic exports, which in some ways shape their cultures. So this is not one region, but several smaller subregions, which I'll go through one by one. Mir is the center of the textile industry, which is pretty important and valuable. Uh, they make fine lace, carpets, and tapestries, which are highly prized. It's also famed for its craftsmen and artisans, and you see how that works, you know, if you're making textiles, you need looms and light machinery to produce those things, and also they make lenses and stuff, and they also make high-grade crossbows. I don't know if you'd say they're techie, but they're good at making light machinery like that, of, you know, medieval-level stuff of weaving machines that you would need to produce textiles. Tyrosh to the west is the center of the color dye industry. You can see how that fits hand in glove, that uh, real-life medieval Europe, uh, Italy would import color dyes from around the Mediterranean, then have to sell them to the textile industries in the low countries, you know, the Flemish textile industry. So you follow the trade routes, and well, why is this one valuable? Well, because we sell color dye 
to Bruges from Genoa or something. So I imagine that there's pretty brisk trade there. Lorath is the northernmost free city that Valyria made, and I kind of see it as comparable to Hamburg, Germany. That it's cold, they have fish, and, well, they have fish. Kohor uh, is the main exporter of timber. They, they say this is all the other free cities like Volantis and Mir, that they chopped down all of their old growth forests centuries upon centuries ago. The land was cleared. That the forest of Kohor is where all the major timber resources in that part of Essos still are. And, that, and it says this in the World Book, that that's the main source of timber for everyone else. Um, also, things you would get from a forest, like furs, pelts, amber, so forth. So, you know, hardy woodsmen, uh, lumberjack types, uh, the, you know, I imagine, you know, like soldiers armed with heavy axes. And they also have very skilled blacksmiths who are capable of reworking Valyrian steel. You know, blacksmiths, you know, you need, you need timber to work the furnace to make the, the steel. And they have their own unique... Uh, cult. They, the, some of the northern free cities were founded as enclaves by local cults in Valyria. Uh, Kohor, it's all blood for the blood god, uh, because of the black goat of Kohor demands blood sacrifice. And interesting point is, in the present day, Kohor is valuable because it dominates trade going to the east and coming back from the east. Uh, the, the overland caravans uh, to Yiti that cross the Dothraki Sea come through there. And it's said that, well, before the Dothraki wiped out the kingdom of Sarnor, which should be flourishing at this point before the doom, uh, this other free city was there called Asaria, which they were the ones dominating trade to the east, and particularly with Sarnor, but they were ruined in the century of blood. That We kept thinking, oh, the Dothraki are such great conquerors, what did they conquer? Because they don't really mention it in the present day. Well, because everyone they conquered is dead, so they're not here anymore. Logically, we're not talking about them. So the world book set up, well, these are peoples that the Dothraki wiped out, that their cities don't exist anymore, and that's why no one talks about them, like the Sarnori. That brings up another point about, I was shown a map of pre-Doom Essos, at times I call it a map of pre-Doom Valyria. It was a map of all of Essos, and it had notes on it. I couldn't... It was flashed at me. I didn't see it very fast. But they went just, oh, well, this is a pre-Doom map. And there's points in the world book where it says, oh, and it lists off cities we have never heard of, and says, these are other cities that got left in ruin besides Asaria. Uh, Draconis was one of them, and Akos Dane. And so... Keep in mind that they have the freedom to introduce cities we've never heard of, like Asaria, or where we only know the name, not what their culture was like, and, and explain, well, they were wiped out by the Dothraki, or they didn't survive the Doom, but we're free to make up a couple of things, because we know there were cities that were destroyed. And by the way, just my own mental headcanon, Kohor always kind of struck me as their analog of Poland. Just because if you think about it, like Poland, they're the furthest east of the west. That everything east of them is Dothraki, or they were constantly fighting Mongol invasions in, in, in medieval Poland. And that also that they're in a forest. It's heavily forested, and you, know, you could say Germany was forested too, but on top of that, they're the farthest east. That Poland is farther east than Germany. So because of all this trade contact with more different peoples... They're more exotic. Like Poland, you know, it's Slavic. It, it's the artwork, the clothing, it's a little different from the we the rest of Western Europe. That similarly, I mean, it actually says in the world book, because of all the foreign trade from the East, Kohor is very exotic and different from the other free cities. From all the overland caravans, just it's not like Pentos, which people from Westeros are used to. Then we get to Pentos, which we actually saw in the TV series, and from what we can discern, they're a major exporter of cheeses. You know, they're surrounded by the Flatlands, which is great dairy country. They mention this. that They're cheesemongers. They make cheese. 
that that's what Robert uh, accuses. Oh, these Pentoshi cheesemongers are har- harboring the Targaryens. That that that's their economic export. They're known for the cheese has to come from somewhere. I mean, who doesn't like cheese? I I'm eating cheese right now. But now, an interesting point, which I, as I keep saying, this so much of this is based on the world of Ice and Fire. The world book mentions that Pentos is exceptional. All the other free cities founded by Valyria were created by minor nobility and still ruled by Valyrian nobles who might not have been dragon lords. But they said explicitly Pentos was weird in that it was just lowborn Valyrian tradesmen and merchants. Uh, back when they had a working class, all the merchants and tradesmen went there. Okay, what the big question is what about the Valyrians who aren't dragon lords, the lower classes? And in Pentos, they there were so few that not only were they not dragon lords, they weren't even nobles. They didn't really care about their blood purity, so they just intermixed with the local Andals. They say it's unique in that it's the only one of the free cities that might have existed before the Valyrians. Lorath did too, but whatever society used to live there got left in ruins, and it was just colonized by Valyria, the same as Norvos and Kohor were. That doesn't count. That Pentos might have been there before as like an Andal town or small city, which the Valyrians either absorbed or outright conquered, but conquered with a light touch and left some of the local elites in place. They go... When you see Illyrio Mopatis in the books, they go, he, he, his people are a mixed race. They're, they don't look Valyrian anymore. They have Valyrian blood in them. But And the world book expands on that, that they intermixed heavily with the Andals, specifically that they seem sort of akin to people in Westeros who are also Andals, because yeah, this is where Andalos used to be. So that's one approach of what did the lowest-rung ethnic Valyrians do? Well, in the case of Pentos they sort of went native and just absorbed peacefully instead of wiping out the local people, and that's why their customs are a little different. And complete contrast with Volantis, which is sort of a foil to that, that Volantis is the first and largest of the free cities, founded long before the Rhoynish Wars, which were some 600 years before this. And it's at the mouth of the Rhoyne River, so it controls access to the inland shipping network. It, its wealth is from trade. And it is, has a huge harbor that all of Bravos and a couple other free cities could easily fit inside. It is massive. It even has these satellite cities that are part... It's like when Florence, medieval Italian Florence, actually controlled other cities as well as part of its little kingdom there, that... Its satellite cities like Volon, Theris, and Valisar, each of those is bigger than King's Landing, and they're just the suburbs of Volantis. And they also make use of a large number of elephants, though I think they import and breed them there. In the aftermath of the Doom, because Volantis was the oldest and largest of the free cities, its rulers saw themselves as the heirs of the Freehold, and they tried to recreate it in the Century of Blood, this series of wars trying to conquer and unify all the other free cities back together, but it didn't work. So, a large number of old blood Valyrian aristocracy survived there, below Dragonlord rank. And it's a question of, well, can we discern things about Valyria from Volantis, because it's the colony successor that's closest to what Valyria was like, and they try to emulate them. Uh, some of the old blood aristocrats of Volantis still follow the, the old Valyrian religion, the one worshipping Valyrian. Well, since at least the middle of the century of blood, Volantis has two political parties. And they're reasonably formal political parties with not just factions, but they have policy platforms of what they want from when they get elected. They run in elections to be triarch. That uh, Volantis is ruled by a council of three people known as triarchs. These two parties are the tigers who favor war. They're the war hawks, the soldiers, and the elephants who favor trade. And it said the elephants are the party of merchants and moneylenders. So, knowing this, a lot of people have been discussing this in the past couple of weeks with me. Are the Elephants a descendant of the pre-Doom Freeholders faction? I noticed the parallels. 
But there's some questions about exactly what these political parties are like, because there's some conflicting quotes. And I asked Elio, co-author of the World Book, himself about this via the Westeros.org forums, you see screenshotted here, that there's these conflicting quotes about, well, they're the party of merchants and moneylenders. Wait, do you mean their candidates are merchants and moneylenders, or that they merchants and moneylenders like to vote for them? Those are two separate things, and the quotes are a little vague. But Elio reaffirmed to me that, you know, for wiki purposes, for the official This Is Canon, Triarchs of Volantis must be old blood of Valyria, including the Elephant Party. I think it's just the book's phrased differently, that they appeal to merchants and moneylenders. And some aristocrats can even become moneylenders. Like Vogaro, they mentioned he, he sold insurance and uh, lent money at interest. So you can be an aristocrat in Volantis and engage in money lending. And it hadn't occurred to me, you know, this is the ruling class. Just because you're the guy who appeals to working class coal miners does not mean you yourself are a coal miner. They're just they're the party that appeals to those people. That's their platform. That's their constituency. You know, here we affirm that, and it doesn't seem that they're the direct successors of the pre-Doom Freeholders faction, just when you look at it, that, well, the pre-Doom Freeholders don't care about blood purity, that they're not aristocrats, they're not hereditary uh, inheriting things. Even the young dragons, who are Valyrian dragonlords, aren't 100% strict about it to the extent that the elephants of Atlantis are. That when they said, no, to run for election, you have to be pure blood to be a triarch in Volantis, even if you're an elephant. And the young dragons aren't that strict. But even the pre doom Senate factions, for that matter, the Sphinxes and the young dragons, aren't really formal political parties with established policy platforms. Like Volantis' tigers and elephants, they're really not comparable to that. Um... Please read a link I'm going to put in the description box below for this really great article on Volantis by Race for the Iron Throne, the blog run by Steve Atwell, uh, author of the book Race for the Iron Throne, the ongoing book series. He did great stuff. He is an amazing historian, and he wrote this breakdown of all, what the different free cities are like politically, and he's talking about Volantis and saying these are the, one of the most formalized political parties in their world, that everyone else is just factions, that they have, they have policy platforms, that it's not as advanced as today's Republicans and Democrats, but like Federalist-era Jacksonian democracy, maybe, that they have a platform, they have formal elections. So please check out the link below. It goes in more detail about that. That, in contrast, the Sphinxes and Young Dragons are directly comparable to the Optimates and Populares from Rome. And it's been emphasized in other sources, the two Senate factions in the Roman Republic, of, you know, like Cicero and Sulla and Marius, they were not political parties. Like, they didn't have a platform of, you want to raise taxes or lower taxes. It's the older aristocracy was in power in Rome, and the younger aristocracy wanted to, to unseat them. That there's a party in power and a party out of power that want that's nipping at their heels. Sphinxes have power, young dragons want power. There are no policies, they don't have different tax views, the way that the elephants and tigers, well, one is pro-war, one is pro-trade. That they, they really don't line up with them, or even with the freeholders. That if you think about it, the tigers maybe are slightly, slightly more similar to the young dragons. But logically, they can't be direct successors, as none of the other Dragonlord 40 families survived. What, what I'm trying to talk about is the lowest tier of Valyrian nobility, like the Valarians and Celtigars, who, as we know, followed the Targaryens to Dragonstone. That There were minor nobility that we would call landed knights to the Dragonlords. Noble families, but they're household retainers who didn't have dragons themselves. The Valarians. So you think the people running Volantis now must be like the Valarians, that they're old-blood Valyrian aristocrats, below dragon rank. So, 
picking all this together and that, well, the elephants care about blood purity on a level the freeholders don't, my personal suspicion, and this is all speculation on my part, please talk about this in the comments, is that the old blood parties of Volantis, both of them, are descended from retainer houses, the minor landed houses like the Valarians, of both the young dragons and possibly the sphinxes, who basically learned their lesson, that they reformed the corrupt political system to appease surviving freeholders, so that now every vote counts and they deeply respect elections. They say there was one point where uh, one of the triarchs in the Century of Blood, who had been elected 40 years running, tried to be elected triarch for life, and they had him killed by being torn apart by four elephants, drawn and quartered by elephants. That the key point of Empire of Ash is the Sphinxes and Young Dragons, it's not really a free and fair election anymore. Votes have become meaningless. Whereas Volantis, they deeply respect the integrity of their elections, granted among the small minority of free, of free people that slaves and freeborn can't vote in them. But still, it seems like they have more respect for the uh, democratic process. And on top of that, because even you know, like an elephant like Vagaro of noble blood is allowed to engage in money lending. They said the Sphinxes and Young Dragons don't do that. It also seems like learning their lesson, they realized the power of wealth and money lending. That after the Doom, they're like Valarian-level houses who aren't freeholders, they were serving the young dragons and sphinxes, and realized, all right, we're in Volantis, we're this tiny remaining enclave of what Valyria was, to not repeat those mistakes that led to the other earlier factions being destroyed, Let's make better elections that are actually fair. And some of them realized there's something to this whole banking and money lending thing that is a route to power. We should start engaging in that. So I think they're like Valarian level people from the Young Dragons who adopted some of the practices of the freeholders more than they are freeholders themselves. But it's interesting thinking about when you have a hierarchical society that, with privilege like that, the mudsill theory. I didn't know this term. I had to look it up, but I know what it is. That thinking about, and a lot of people have asked this over Twitter, what is the position of the ethnically Valyrian people that are below the dragon lords themselves? On the one hand, you have Pentos, and on the other hand, you have Volantis, where Pentos basically sided with, well, we'll just intermarry with them, whereas Volantis was, no, we are above them, even though none of them have dragons. The Mudsill Theory, and I'll link this in the description, uh, it was a term to describe that most white people in the southern United States during the slavery era didn't actually own slaves. They were poor. I mean, slave plantation owners in the antebellum south were our equivalent of like an oil baron or something, the, the top 1% of 1%, and they owned, one person owned thousands of slaves. It wasn't like there were one or two slaves in every household in the South. By demographics, by headcount, most white people in the South, like 90%, didn't own slaves. And then the problem was in the post-war Reconstruction period, where you have the KKK and Jim Crow segregation, Black civil rights were most vehemently opposed by poor whites. When you actually see, like, who were members of the KKK or George Wallace types that were opposing integration, they, they were opposed by poor people. That as long as you have some other group to point at and say, I'm better than them, it makes you feel better. And Martin Luther King Jr. summed this up pretty well in a speech he gave that the Southern plantation aristocracy took the world and gave the poor white man Jim Crow, and when his wrinkled stomach cried out for the food that his empty pockets could not provide, he ate Jim Crow, a psychological bird that told him that no matter how bad off he was, at least he was a white man, better than the black man. And when his undernourished children cried out for the necessities that his low wages could not provide, he pointed at the Jim Crow signs on the buses and in the stores, on the streets and in the public buildings, and his children, too, learned to feed upon Jim Crow, their last outpost of psychological oblivion. That 
the the way that the hyper rich plantation aristocracy and later the the really top land owning class in the South were able to dominate all of these poor white people for so long, and you know it, it was terrible economic inequality, was hey have fun with some racism that you can walk around as this dirt poor farmer saying I'm better than any black man, and if any black man starts. Uh, doing well economically, the KKK or other groups would attack them. And this extends to all hierarchical societies throughout history. You see that the lower classes take joy in, or are encouraged to, to beat up on a minority to go, well, okay, at least we're better than them. Uh, scapegoating, uh, Jews, homosexuals, uh, illegal immigrants, Latinos, just any group that's marginalized you use the, them as a whipping boy, as, as a scapegoat, to hold up the, the lowest rung of the privileged class. And Martin actually wrote a bit of that in, in the Valanza sections of A Dance with Dragons. They point out even the poorest of the free-born people in Volantis, who are, they could never run for Triarch. They're just, I'm a poor shop owner, but I'm technically a free-born Volantine. Hate Daenerys. That they do not support Daenerys because at least I'm a better than a slave. That the lowest freeborn person is still better than a slave, and if you don't have a slave to look down on, what are you? So, and I'm going on to this at length of just what is the attitude of Valyrians who are below Dragonlord rank? And I think it comes down to are you benefiting from the Dragonlords? Think if you're like the Valarians or the upper rung regional governor of Volantis, the Dragon Lords are doing pretty good by you, so you're pretty good with the status quo. But if you're more of a you know small farmer freeholder, like I just own a dairy farm in Pentos, and you went out there as a colonist, you'd side with the freeholders. So it depends if you're benefiting from it or not. Like. Uh, American Revolution, that a lot of the Tories, people that still supported the British, were people who, you know, like, owned companies, shipping companies that benefited from British rule. That are you benefiting from this ruling class or not? But if nothing else, um, given that we had nothing to talk about after the Long Night prequel announcement, we're going to have a lot to talk about with this from, you know, Info of the World of Ice and Fire particularly because Elio and Linda actually wrote that detail about Pentos. They worked out, not Martin, that they came up with the idea that Pentos is the only one of the free cities where they're actually there before the Valyrians, and they were Valyrians who went native and intermingled with the local Andals. And they explained this to me in a forum post once, that it's we rounded it out and we thought it was implied that that's what happened, and it turns out Martin said, actually, I never thought of anything for Volantis's background, but this is so good, I'd like to incorporate it. So they came up with that idea for Pentos, but Martin really liked it and gave his blessing to it. So other things in the world book, like everything east of the Free Cities is all Martin, but they worked out some stuff like, well, this is what lower commoner Valyrians would be in Pentos or, or Volantis. So I look forward to what they'll say about this, because they thought a lot of this up themselves. So that's the first of four parts in this video, just general economic landscape of what the freehold is. And last and most important is the wealthiest province, Sothorios. The rest of this video is going to be talking about that in depth.